Hello friends, my name is Carl Sterling. Thanks for joining us today. So we're coming at you from uh, the Syracuse, New York area. And uh, today I'm at the office of a friend of mine who also happens to be my personal chiropractor and um, my chiropractor forever because he's the best. And I'd like to introduce my special guest, Dr. Hunter Mullen. How are you? I'm doing good today. All right, Doc. It's all good th to all see things you. considered during these times. The COVID times. Yes. We shook hands, we got sanitizer. Yeah. So, <laughs> pre, pre and post. Yeah. Yeah, and as a lot of you know, these, these interviews are relatively informal, but really what it is about sharing information. So I met you probably about two years ago, I think. That sounds about right. Somewhere in that area. And, um, you know, one of the things, well, the thing that uh, I really liked at first the most, besides now I get to know you and every time I see you, you tell me about a great book to read, <laughs> is your approach to things. You know, uh, no disrespect to any other chiropractor out there or any who might see me who I've been to. But um, when I come here, this is what I want to kind of get at, is your approach to how you're uh, working with people because I will have pain, as I'm sure a lot of people mm -hmm. do, right? But where I hurt might not be where you're working on me and my body. Right. So can you share with us a little bit about your approach and... Uh, you know, how, how are you thinking when you're going in like this? What's, sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, the large majority of patients that I see uh, come to me because they're experiencing low back pain, neck pain, headaches, uh, pain into their legs, pain into their arms. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be extremity related, and ankle, shoulders. It's, it's usually neuromusculoskeletal related types of pain. So when I first assess a patient, I sit down with them, you know, we figure out from what they're telling me what, where I think this is coming from. So I think it's important for me to understand the nature of their complaint and, of course, rule out uh, anything that would not be amenable to my approach, right. which I'm going to get to in just a moment. Sure. Because some, sometimes pain can be elusive and it can come from areas that you don't even consider. And I teach, so I always tell my students, if you're not considering it or looking for it, you're never going to find it. Mm -hmm. So you kind of look at the big picture and then try and narrow it down with a, a good assessment, which would include orthopedic test, a neurological assessment, and then a very uh, uh, good functional assessment. In other words, we want to look at the whole person not just the part that's screaming at us. Mm, yeah. So uh, the body, it, everything's connected, right? And I, I, I oh, noticed that. in one of your interviews, you, uh, you, inter you uh, interviewed um, uh, the anatomy trains, uh, Tom oh, Myers. Thomas Myers, Tom, yes. Tom Myers, and, and yeah, he's, he's uh, one of my uh, mentors, if you will, mm -hmm. although we've never met, I've studied his material and sure. I, I've watched a lot of his videos, and I incorporate his work into into what I teach and what I do. So Tom Myers made sense of some of these connections, and that's what a functional assessment is really about: right. understanding the connections. How is the bottom of the foot, the plantar fascia, connected to the low back, and could a, a dysfunctional uh, ankle affect the low back. Yeah. Uh, we're moving creatures, so we get up, we get down, we move about, and everything is in balance. Mm -hmm. So there's push and pull, there's tension and relaxation, and everything in, in that regard is connected. Uh, so when, and, and your nervous system that controls all that with your muscles, everything's very coordinated. When I, when I lift my arm up over my head, everything is like an orchestra. You yeah, know, it sounds right. great when everyone's doing their job. Exactly. And, and that's what the nervous system, the nervous system is like the conductor. Uh -huh. It's kind of coordinating everything. And it's all dependent on each individual being good. Yeah, and, and right. Being, and being the proper, muscles have to be the proper length. A very common altered posture is a forward shoulder, forward head posture, mm -hmm. right? For example, right? Right. And when you're in that posture, 
your, your pecs are short in the front, your, your neck muscles in the front are stretched out and become weak, the muscles in the back of your neck get short and tight, and now so they're, send, yeah, they're, they're sending <laughs> faulty signals in yeah, about right. your position in space. Mm -hmm. And it's no wonder that people develop headaches and upper back pain. It's like you're holding a bowling ball out here yeah. instead of holding it here. Uh, so, well, that, let me interrupt you for one second. Sure. I, I just remembered there's some equation. It's something like for every inch forward your head is beyond optimal position, yes. doesn't that weigh effectively like 10 more pounds it, or something? It, I don't know the exact numbers, but yes, it's, it's You could have five inch, four inches yeah. forward and be like literally a bowling ball. It's there. enormous. Yeah. It's an enormous. Okay. Uh, we'll have to Google that. Yeah. And see what it actually is. Yeah. But, uh, so getting back to your original question, I, I, I think what I, what I do differently, uh, and I wouldn't say I'm the only person that does this, but I like to to initially focus in on, on why the person's there, you know, specifically their neck, their back, whatever it might be, come up with a good working diagnosis, an understanding of what the problem is, and then looking at the big picture, mm -hmm. looking at the whole forest to see if there is anything impacting the area that their specific symptoms may be coming from, like uh, overpronation at the ankle. Sure. The arches are dropped. Mm -hmm. Or if I, if I w w to watch somebody move in a squat, I'd be able to see that their extremities are aligned properly or not, telling me certain muscles might be overactive, certain muscles might be weak. Yeah. You did that with me, I remember. And I did that with you. You used that tripod with Yeah, camera. I used yeah. that, and yeah. uh, we took some pictures of it in an app that I can mm -hmm. slow down That's and actually nice. look at you move. Mm -hmm. And that helps me come up with a rehabilitation prescription, if you will, yeah, right? Sure. Yeah. And I mentioned working diagnosis, so we work what we think is gonna help, and if it's helping, we keep working it, right. and if it's not helping, we tweak it. And you mentioned earlier that we, that you notice I don't do the same thing every time. That's because I'm tweaking the plan, right? right? right. So it, it, it wouldn't be, you know, there's that old saying, it's probably a cliche, but Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Exactly. Yeah. And and I, I use that that uh, saying in, in my teaching because it's true. It's true. If you you know you're not going to keep throwing the same thing at it and expect all of a sudden one day it's going to be different. If if yeah. you're on the right track, you should see results. You should get the outcomes you want. Now, there's a lot of unknowns. There's lifestyle, uh, patients. Uh, uh, you know, they come to, to me with a, a lifetime of, of activities and postures and, mm -hmm. and lifestyle choices that they've made. So sometimes I actually do explore that too. I sure. mean, I, I'll say, well, what are you eating? Or, you know, what's your exercise routine like? Yeah. Many, the, the, the modern Western diet, which <laughs> most of us are on, mm -hmm. all right, and combined with our fast-paced lifestyles, uh, and fat, you know, eating out a lot and uh, not being able to get good quality food. I mean, you go to the supermarket, there's hardly any food in it unless you're around the perimeter of the store. It's all yeah. processed stuff. But it's very, in general, very pro inflammatory. Yeah. So it many is. of us are in, in fl inflamed states, yes. and that makes us very sensitized to all kinds of problems. And you got to start somewhere. So I, I, yeah, I, I like yeah. to start local and then kind of expand out globally to kind of see what else could be impacting this. Then pe pe people are on medication that affect their, their life, that affect yeah. their physiology. Uh, there's so many, so many things to really consider. It's really interesting. I, some of this I learned from you um, during one of our talks. But, it, you know, I look with my clients now, you know, as a, a trainer, especially with well, it doesn't matter. People with Parkinson's are people too. I would have to say that because no, 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 you know, no. cancer doesn't define a person. A hip replacement doesn't. Uh, you know, Alzheimer's, whatever. I, 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 I had family members with Parkinson's. Oh, so you do? yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes. An yeah. uncle, and actually, my my grandfather uh, oh. had Parkinson's disease. Man, I'm sorry to hear that. It's uh, it can be really rough, you know, and, and it affects everybody uniquely differently sure. too. Sure. Right. Uh, depending upon so many different factors, but. You know, no matter who the person is or what they're dealing with, um, it seems like, especially as we get older, we have a lifetime of stuff that we've done. Like maybe it was our, our career choice and maybe the position we're in all day, every day, mm -hmm. whether it's sitting, sure. 
or you know I'm banging nails all the time and right. this shoulder's gone and hurts down here mm. and or different stressors in their life lack of sleep mm -hmm. that book you told me about why we sleep you you read that right like, like three times That's why amazing, we sleep amazing. I don't remember the author just Walker Dr. Walker. Walker I am so glad you told me about that book because wow man it's sleep has a huge impact on so many things short term and long term that's a pandemic you don't hear about. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's true, yeah. Yeah, so I love this approach that you have about start local, go global, and you know, that, that can extend beyond the body right into the life uh, style, like, right? It does. Activities, sports. I mean, lack even... Lack of activity. Even, <laughs> even when I see a patient, I mean, I only have them for a very short amount of time. Yeah. And then they're just out... And, and that's, the, that's the important part when they're not in my office, uh -huh. uh, how they, the choices that they make. Yeah. And, and the, I'll advise patients, I think you should do this, I think you should do that. I'll, I'll give them an exercise prescription. I think you should, you know, supplement because it'll just help maybe, you know, give you a, a loading dose of nutrition that you need. But yeah. not, you know, not everybody uh, is willing yeah, to, that's to make true, to man. make some of these choices, and I I don't understand it. I, I I try not to be judgmental about it, but you know I I think that people make a choice of whether they want to be well or whether they choose not to be well. It's, it's I it, 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 that might sound simplistic, but I wow. experience this with my own family members. You you know you can tell <laughs> you can tell somebody, right. you know this is what you need to do to get well, and. And when you say to someone, well, you know, I think you should really cut back on, on grains of all types because your body just turns it into sugar yeah. and sugar yeah. produces insulin and insulin has all kinds of detrimental effects in your body when you have it at sustained levels. And they look at me like, no, I'm not giving up that morning <laughs> bagel. I mean, I mean, there's a place for it. Yeah. You know? Maybe not every uh, day. Maybe not every day or maybe, com see, the, the thing, we, we need carbs. Right, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a necessary fuel. Yep. But you, you need it most when you're exercising, mm -hmm. right? When you're burning, when yeah, your muscles exactly. are on fire. Yeah, you so if you're an up. athlete, you're burning up, and you're, you're, you're making those muscles work. You know, after you work out, then it's okay to do some carbs. But yep. if, you're, if you're sitting on a couch just binging Netflix all the time, yeah. then it's gonna just create inflammation. Well, oh yeah, let's, so let's go down that path for a minute. Um, but before we do, um, just finishing this book that I'm writing, it's, it's huge. And the, the one part I've gone back to is patient or client compliancy on home exercise, okay. right? How do we get people to engage? How do we sh have them see the importance of the things that, like I would recommend as a trainer? Or, or how do you find, uh, do you have any kind of tricks up your sleeve for compliancy and the and of course, a lot of that depends upon personality type right. too, right? There's so many factors. Well, uh, I'm glad you asked that. So, so rehab uh, is a very important part of my approach, mm -hmm. right? And um, most of the rehab is done, you know, outside the office. Now, you'll notice that the camera can't see it, but in this room, I have a rehab station set up. I've got physio balls here. Yeah. I've got elastic bands, mm -hmm. uh, and I use these to to introduce the patient to the exercise they want them to do. And then these are low tech. So low tech is, is the way to go. And now if someone belongs to a gym and they want to use the gym, that's great. They're already yeah. pre-motivated because they've, uh -huh. they've been going to the gym. So sometimes, you know, with some patients it's easy, yeah. right? They, they like to work out. More often than not though, that's not the case. And so my, my formula is don't give them too much. I'd rather have them a li yeah. do a little bit uh, less than what they need and have them do it than give them everything that they need and have them do nothing. I like that a lot, and I think that for some people that's the answer. Yeah. Here are two or three things, yeah. not so eight I, things. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, and, that, and that's what I teach my students as well. I said, you know, give uh, them like just that. one or two exercises. Don't overload them because then you're not, then you're not going to get any compliance at all. Mm -hmm. and I'd rather get a little compliance than no compliance. Yeah, I have, Keith, it's a constant learning curve. I think sometimes it just depends upon the person, their personality type, their motivation, this and that, mm -hmm. and blah, blah, blah. And they're, uh, sometimes they're just overwhelmed. 
especially if they have never exercised in their life when this happens, right? right? You probably and, and, and this fear behavior as well. Patients, sure. they pay patient and catastrophize. They they're afraid if they move a certain way, it's going to come back because that's how it happened to them. Sure. You know, they were sitting at their breakfast nook having coffee one day, and all of a sudden, it felt like someone hit them with a sledgehammer in their back. Yeah. They don't understand where that came from. It was brewing, it, you know. Uh -huh. It didn't just happen from that last movement. That was just the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. But it, but once a patient has severe symptoms, usually associated with pain and inability to carry out their activities of daily living, it's scary. Yeah. And I see my job, at least as part of my management of a patient like that, is to minimize that that catastrophic thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone gets back pain at some point. You know, it's just like, you know, your hair getting a little bit gray as you get older or losing that turgor in your skin or the amount <laughs> of hair, perhaps. Yeah. But, uh, but it's just natural. Yeah, and, it and, is. And, and, and we don't cure, we don't cure back pain. We manage it. Right. It's, it's part of just what happens to us. And the better you manage it, the less it will interfere yeah. with the quality of your life. So it's just thinking. Um, speaking of f movement and fear, uh, I just had a conversation recently. We recently with a friend who's uh, actually a chiropractor in uh, Boston. Uh, really cool guy. He uh, does a lot with the uh, kinesiology taping and rock yes, tape. Yes, 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 um, yes. So we were talking about this fear thing, and I I I see this in the population I work with the most uh, movement disorders. Um, of course, that's largely personality type based. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we go, some people are, uh, they have like reckless gait almost, and they're mm -hmm. not afraid of anything, and they're at higher risk of falling because they're, they're springing up. And, right. right. And then we have the fall phobia, the sedentary lifestyle where they're, you know, atrophy and all this, I because it's fear. So education seems to be a good thing. A pretty good thing with people, but still, it's difficult for me to deliver. Do you have any tricks up your sleeve on the education of the fear, or trying to? Uh, I kind of already asked you this, but I'm trying to come from a little different angle. I come into you, and I'm afraid because you want me to do something. Maybe what's a what's a common thing you would have somebody do as an exercise that they're afraid to do? Uh, maybe uh, stretch out their hamstrings or, you know, try and strengthen their core. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm afraid of the hamstring thing, so not really, but... No, I get it. What, what would a modification be? How would, you, how would you help me with that? Well, you know, pain is a powerful, is a powerful demotivator. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you give a, a, a patient an exercise or a stretch, or you encourage them to do an activity they're afraid they're going to hurt themselves. So what I try and, and instill in them is that it's just the nature of the beast. It's, 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 not, it's, it's not that they don't have to be scared of it, but it's not going to make them worse. Yeah, right? okay, that's and good. It's not, going to, it's not going to make their condition go in the wrong direction. If anything, it's normal to have ups and downs, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the healing curve is not just a straight line. There's dips and valleys that occur. That's part of how it, 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 part of how we heal. That's how it works. And just try and do the best I can to, you know, minimize their their anxiety level regarding uh, activities. And sometimes I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sometimes I'll, I'll put myself in their place. You know, and yeah. like uh, patients. When I was a, this is interesting. When I was a, a younger practitioner. Uh, I utilized, and I still utilize radiographs, imaging, to kind of see if there's any underlying pathology, see if there's any contraindications. But sometimes you look at imaging, especially with the advent of MRI where we see all this detail, mm -hmm. and patients often look pretty bad. If you're looking, if you're judging them but just on their images, they look pretty bad. But they don't necessarily reflect that in their functional functionality or how they feel. Yeah. We are not our images. Right, the images don't tell the whole story because if a patient has, let's say, a severe disc herniation on MRI, right, and we treat them using, let's say, decompression therapy, which is the kind of table we're sitting oh, on right now, I love it. Uh, and let's say in, in four or six weeks, their 
ninety percent better. Uh -huh. If we were to reimage them, their back would look exactly the same on really? MRI. Oh That's yes, okay. yeah, and it might never change. So there's a lot more to what we see oh. on the image. Uh -huh. uh, it's related to inflammation. You don't necessarily see that on the film okay. or on the MRI okay. image. So that's the next path I want to go down. I want to make sure we talk about so I so I'll, so I'll, I'll say to a patient, I can I can honestly say this now because oh so I was saying, I was I kind of got away from my point. So I used to uh, put my put the images up and I kind of read my patients a riot act. Right? Mm -hmm. This is what you look like, yeah. right? Uh -huh. I don't do that anymore mm -hmm. because it's counterproductive. You know, it, it instills that that uh, uh, fear behavior. Okay, you know, I have sure. patients come in and say, hey, I have a disc. And I said, welcome to the club. I have a disc too, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, like, we're not, we're, we're not our, our pathology, uh -huh. right? Okay. Everybody has pathology. Yeah. It's more about how you function and how you are, uh, uh, have the ability to, to perform your activities of daily living and yeah, enjoy sure. and enjoy life. Right. You know, like, we're, not, we're not our degeneration. You think, you think arthritis was a condition. Uh -huh. I mean, it is, but you know, you can't watch the media or TV without seeing some, uh, uh, pushing some kind of oh, yeah. uh, medication to help you play golf or to help you enjoy oh, playing yeah. outside with your kids. Right. You know, uh, I, I have to laugh. There's a lot of brainwashing going on. Yeah, that's interesting. So, so I don't know if I answered your question. I kind of felt like right. I did a roundabout. So I, 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 I just... Coming back full circle, I just try and do my best to to minimize the fear associated with whatever it is that they're fearful. You know telling that? them, telling them, you know, I trade X-rays with you. Like that's what I was gonna say. Because yeah. my back looks like a train wreck okay. last time I had it imaged, right? Okay. But I, you know, I take care of myself and I, yeah. I don't think about it, right. right? Right. Matter of fact, I try and put positive thoughts into into my head about it. Well, it's gonna, it's actually gonna improve. Is my self thought. I you know, see, I'm yeah, going to sure. develop more volume in my canal. Yeah. My degeneration isn't going to interfere. I, you know, I think, you know, there's that mind-body connection, which is probably the topic of a whole different That's interview. That's another interview, too. That's another we interview. Do another one but, uh, yeah, I just try and minimize things. Yeah, okay, so my question was, having thrown something up your sleeve, and you know what, I was thinking, and this is why I love doing this, because I'm a geek and I like to learn, right? Mm -hmm. Um... I think intuitively I do this to a degree, but minimizing fear is enough without having to even politely deliver a whole bunch of information that might scare them, even if you say it in a nice way, right? Exactly. So exactly. Why That's it. do that if you can just minimize fear and they can go on their way and not worry it? nearly as much. That's great, man. I like that. And I think that's a fault of modern of our modern uh, uh, yeah. disease care system, really, is yeah. that there's not enough of that going on. Uh, yeah, that's good. It's, you know, it's, and I, not to blame a, a, a particular profession, because all professionals do this. They concentrate on, on you know, what the disease is, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it doesn't really, I, yes, I, it's important to understand the disease for us as, as healthcare providers, right. but you're not your disease. Exactly. Uh, you are uh, a fully functioning human uh -huh. that's capable of improving. Yeah. And you just have to find out the, the uh, strategies to kind of go in that direction. And there's always strategies. It may, you know, the goal isn't to get cured or to be 100%. The goal, again, is quality of life. Quality of life. Huge, huge. Um, yeah, I love that. We are not our disease because it's so true. And it's another thing I was writing about is in my travels especially, uh, more so in North America, not so much in Europe though, is we'll see... I'll, I'll just speak to the trainer community. No offense to anybody, there's some amazing trainers. Like so, There are so many amazing trainers who come to our workshops and who are out there, but there are also people who allow a condition to define a person. Right. And not intentionally, not even... It, it's not like they mean anything. It's, it's actually part of our training. That, I, we're, as, as, as trainers, as PTs, yeah. as chiropractors, as uh, medical physicians, you know, we're trained uh -huh. uh, to some extent. You know, we, we stand on the shoulders of all those that came before us, and they were trained by people before them, yeah. and it's kind of like just passed down through the generations. Yeah. I think it's, for someone like myself, it's, it's more of a self-actualization of, of kind of figuring it out. Uh, and uh, I mean, because I, because I, because I'm 
just as guilty as anybody else in, in the beginning of my career. Uh, uh, me too, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> excuse me. So, yeah, that's um, uh, this is great, man. I, there's another thing I want to ask you about. Sure. That I know it's a big thing. So I'll I'll just start by saying that. Um, well, actually, the last time I saw you, I was about 15 pounds heavier, and I has was just getting ready to take off to go to Singapore, where I had health issues. I'm fine now. But uh, what I found is, and, and we can talk about this from any angle you want. Sure. But what I found is if I eat foods that fall into the anti-inflammatory categories, category, I lost weight, I feel better, and my joint pain is gone. Like, I actually have no pain in my body that I used to that would, like, from inflammation. So you... Um, you see a lot of inflammation, I'm sure, right? You're dealing with it every day, all the time? Uh, I would say it's almost uh, universal, yeah. I think. Again, it, it relates to our, our modern Western diets and lifestyles. Yeah. And I have explored this uh, in, very intently. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 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 I'm very hungry for all this information personally. Yeah, and the reason that I that I, that I'm that way is because I, I I at some point I realized that my patients were all inflamed as well. Uh -huh. So here I am, I'm treating patients with pain, and some of them I noticed they just never get better. Right, right? they're just constantly in pain. So I naturally beg begs the question: Why 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 aren't these patients yeah. improving? And that that started me on my self. Uh, exploration of, of the systemic inflammation that's almost pandemic in, in our in modern society. So uh, uh, the work of David Seaman, for example, who wrote the uh, Deflaming Guidelines. Um, Wait a minute. I don't think you told me about that book. <laughs> I, I, think, I think I did. Did I, you really? Yeah. Ruh -ruh. We always talk books, and just before we went on camera, you were also talking about not to get away. We'll get right back okay. to Genius Foods. Yes. That's another one. But um, so back to this, Seaman wrote which one? Uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure of the name of the book, but basically it's about deflaming. Wow. The deflame diet. I think it's called the deflame diet. David okay. Seaman. And uh, if you were to Google uh, deflaming guidelines you'd come up with, with this material, right. for example. Yeah, like and and uh, David is a chiropractor, I believe he lives in Florida, and uh, he's, uh, he's graduated from my alma mater, but he kind of branched into the nutrition a long, long time ago, uh -huh. and so that's his main thing. And, and uh, having uh, heard him lecture, uh, and having uh, read all of his uh, papers and, and material, mm -hmm. it's kind of uh, springboarded me into really exploring this area more in more detail. And uh, so, in a nutshell, uh, if if we uh, are consistently eating uh, uh, sugar refined foods, which would include you know your pastas, your rices, your cereals, your breads. Uh, your grains, you know, pretty much, you know, all the things that are in the aisles of the supermarket, the whole cereal aisle, yeah. all those things are very, very inflammatory. And I, you know, I'm I'm a clinician. I'm not a I'm not a, a biochemist. And mm -hmm. but there are, if you look at the work of Seaman, he'll explain in, yeah. in understandable terms of why these foods produce inflammation in the body. Right. And the other thing that's uh, really a big part of our inflammatory lifestyles are all the commercial polyunsaturated fats that are in our foods. So yeah. these include your corn oil and your canola oil and your uh, yeah. every oil for that matter, uh, yeah, grapeseed oil. Everything. The, the only really good oils would be extra virgin olive oil uh -huh. and um, avocado oil sure. and coconut oil. Yeah. Right. And and grass fed butter. All the things that were on the big hit list, at least the butter and the coconut oil years ago, that when fat was the demon. But yeah, right. I remember that. But uh, yeah, so all of these all of these polyunsaturated fats, corn oil, vegetable oils, all contribute to this systemic inflammation that we have. 
fried foods, uh, foods with chemicals in them, emulsifiers, uh, all of these things add up and contribute to this pro-inflammatory state in our body. So I, I like to explore that with patients and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll continue to treat them. I, like I have patients who don't want to do anything about that. Like the thought of giving up their, their soda and their, yeah. uh, and their muffins and, and things of that nature is just abhorrent to them and they won't do it. Yeah. So I'll say, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try and help you as best I can. Yeah. And, and they're okay with that. Yeah. And, and, and I've become okay with that as well at this point because I'm, now I'm kind of like a Band-Aid. If you want me to be a Band-Aid for you, I'll do that. I'd rather help you not need the Band-Aid, yeah. but if that's what you need from me, then uh, you know, I'll be happy to do that for you as well. Well, the behavior part is, but you know, we've been, it's almost been forced on us to, not to blame, but well, with the all, education that's available now and people like you sharing, and I, I talk with people and there's books and all that, we should, we should kind of know now, and I know there's a movement well, in that. Well, we're brainwashed. But it's very slowly moving that way because of that. Yes. Exactly, yes. You can't, everyone who watches this, and, and I've done this, when I'm watching TV at night, just start to write down every commercial you see. Oh. Right? Just kind of put a little note, what was this for? It's all about getting you to make a choice that's very likely not good for you. Some of the... Uh... There was a, a YouTube thing I ran across last year at some point, a little 10 minute clip of a lady who worked as a marketing strategist or something for a major food company who resigned and went on the opposite. She said, I can't do it anymore because I'm designing labels to make things look healthy and to make you buy them. These are not healthy. That's going on a lot too. And you know, and the food itself is addictive. Yeah, so, it so is. So like when, you're, is, eat, when yes. you're eating, uh, uh, Foods that are turning into sugar in your body. Sugar is like crack. Yeah, right? it's really, and it's very, yeah. very addictive. You want it, and you want, you and want it's, and it, it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't have very good nutrient density, so it's not giving you what you need, and you want more of it, yeah. right? Because it's not really satisfying you. It's, it, it just creates a, a desire for more of it. Yep. Have you ever read the book? Uh, I think it's the Hacking of the American Mind. Uh, no. Robert, Robert Lustig. I, I, that, that author sounds familiar. I'll have to yeah. check it out. Yeah, yeah. I'll, sh I'll send that send to you. Send me the link. Yeah, I will. It's uh, what you just said. That's the book. And he's written other books on it, too. But the addiction factor, the, uh, I remember seeing in his book in a New York Times article. Now, it's different. This was about, sorry, Frito-Lay, it's about Doritos. But uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it had to do with the chemical engineering which went into the Doritos. And then, of course, it's happening in all these other industries, too, with all their chips and this and that, and, and the sugars that are used when they use sugar, that these chemicals go into your body. They short-circuit the uh, hormone leptin, mm -hmm. you know, the one yes. that says to your yes. brain, oh, I'm full. Yes. Well, that, it is kind of like when Jay Leno used to do the commercials about Doritos, like 20 years ago, I bet mm -hmm. you can't just eat one. You can't because you'll never know you're mm -hmm. full until yes. the bag is gone and you want another bag and you still won't be full. So it's, it's the engineering behind it. It's as bad as the brainwashing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I, I just had another thought along with that. You know, our gut health is very important too. Huge. And uh, again, the, the, the modern Western diet is so, so lacking in fiber. And that's what your gut bacteria want. They want fiber. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, if your gut's messed up, your whole immune system is going to be messed up, and uh, it's going to just uh, contribute to that pro-inflammatory state systemically. So, uh, well, I know you know this already, but it would be interesting to talk about. the uh, So much research out there is showing that the nerves of the gut, the nerves of the bowel, uh, I know this neurologist, uh, Tony Lang. And Connect directly to the brain. Yeah. So eventually, that? right, eventually all this inflammation down here, maybe through the vagus nerve, at some point, boom. And then it takes a while, but then, oh, you got a tremor. Maybe it's Parkinson's. Or not everyone with Parkinson's gets a tremor, but maybe it's Alzheimer's. Maybe it's something else, a brain infection or whatever. But, yeah, this inflammation, uh, Dale Bredesen, here's another book, 
The End of Alzheimer's. Fantastic book. I got to have lunch with him and meet him in New York about two and a half years ago. Um, talks about how Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and other things will live here for 10 to 20 years right. before they show up here. You'll, and it really you'll, comes you'll, to do with what you have to do. You'll find with. that connection in Genius Foods as well. Oh, really? I can't yes. wait. Genius yes. Foods. That's yes. my next book. Good. Good. I'm glad. So you teach, um, as we start to line towards the end here, you teach at the, the college. I am an uh, associate professor at New York Chiropractic College. I've been with the college for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, I started uh, my uh, connection with New York Chiropractic College back in the... In the mid 80s mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I started as a part-time clinician in their outpatient facilities the college was actually on Long Island at the time which is where I'm originally from oh, okay and then in uh, I believe it was around the early 90s like 90 91 the college uh, moved to central New York it moved to really? Seneca Falls it took over yeah. the old Eisenhower College in Seneca Falls okay. I didn't realize and, they were in Long Island yeah. first so I, I had never uh, like I said, I was from Long Island. I had never even heard of Seneca Falls. Upstate to me was like you know, uh, just just north of the uh, Westchester. Yeah, yeah, Westchester <laughs> County. You know. <laughs> sure. I, uh, so anyway, long story short, I had a short break from the college, uh, but uh, that kind of catapulted me to personally to realize how much I missed the teaching aspect mm -hmm. of what I what I was mixing into my my practice, and. Uh, I applied for a position at the college up in Seneca Falls, and uh, they liked what I had to offer. And, Great. And uh, the rest is history. I've been uh, I've been associated with the college ever since then. So I I moved up to Sir to the Syracuse area in uh, in like ninety five ninety six. Okay. And I've been with this practice in Camillus here almost since then, like late nineties. I started here, and I've been teaching full time and practice. So I started out practicing full-time and teaching part-time, and then I transitioned from uh, practicing part-time and teaching full-time, so I kind of flipped it on its head. Okay. So that's what I do now. I, I teach full-time. I, I teach in the clinical sciences department of right. New York Chiropractic College. So I, I train chiropractors in, in their uh, manipulative skills set oh, okay. and sure. uh, the psycho before generation ability and you know how to, how to expertly deliver the manipulative skills that that's chiropractors great. do. And I also teach diagnosis and management of, of spinal conditions and connective tissue, soft tissue techniques as well. Um, on a side note, when I was a musician, as my primary income for a long time, both here and at the chiropractic college, I used to do gigs. We did the Cairo holiday party every year for many years in a row. And this used to be Carmen's restaurant. Yes. And they did weddings. I played, yes. I probably had to be literally a hundred weddings here yes. at least from yes. the 70s and 80s yes. yeah this used to be Carmen's restaurant before we were here uh, Dr. Peering and his and his wife and the physical therapist they own this building mm -hmm. they purchased it and before that they we were at the Delta Sonic where the Delta Sonic is oh in the uh, west side yeah uh, there's a strip mall there there used to be a strip mall there the valley oh yeah that's right the bit I remember the strip mall yeah it was right across the street from the and uh, yeah yeah okay that's yeah, where, that's where wow. we were. Yeah. So for those of you who are local here, and especially the west side of Syracuse or Salve, Camillus, you you know what we're talking about. Right. Yeah. That's cool. Um, I didn't tell you I was going to ask you this question because I never tell anyone because I forget. But you'll be able to answer it. <laughs> do you have, in, in closing, do you have a single or more, even more than one takeaway message for anyone in particular, whether it's the your student community or uh, just you know, chiropractors, movement specialists, patients, anybody. Takeaway message. Takeaway message uh, for any healthcare provider uh, that is uh, seeing patients of any kind. My takeaway would be to look at the forest, to kind of consider the whole patient, even if you're a specialist. So, so chiropractors are considered neuromusculoskeletal specialists, uh -huh. right? But we, you know, we don't function in that kind of vacuum. You, living uh, systems aren't like that. Mm -hmm. Everything's interconnected. Yeah. One part affects the other part. So my takeaway would be to really consider 
uh, a working diagnosis, figure out what it, what it is that's, that's disturbing your patient's balance, their homeostasis, yeah. and then, you know, uh, approach it with a, you know, best evidence, reasonable plan that, that you know, makes sense and is supported. Uh, and and tweak it based on other things that may be impacting it. Perhaps it's uh, damage to uh, their ankle from many years ago or a sports injury. Yeah. Uh, just as an example, chronic ankle sprains are associated with hip abductor weakness, and that okay. can that can <laughs> alter just how you walk a little bit. Yeah. And how often do we walk? We walk a lot. Right, so if you if it's not the one little faulty movement that mm -hmm. is the problem, it's the re repetitive over and over again that adds up and uh, causes the wear and tear and damage and inflammation that eventually causes tissue breakdown. And, and so, again, getting back to your original uh, closing thought question, there, just just consider the whole patient. Look at, especially for doctors uh, and therapists who kind of approach it from from a neuromusculoskeletal basis, look at their posture, uh, look at uh, how they move, uh, develop some skills in being able to utilize functional assessment to help you come up with a rehab prescription. And then look at other things that may be impacting their overall ability to, to heal. So such yeah. as, you know, do they have systemic inflammation? What meds are they on? Uh, as on a personal note, you know, I'm on certain meds, and, and now I'm, I'm investigating what these meds might be doing to me. <laughs> yeah. You know, right. because the more, I, I, the more I read and the more I study, the more I understand how things impact yeah. you. And it might be helping one area, but is that really what's best for me yeah. or my patient? So that would be my takeaway. I, I love that. It's, and I would... Um, I'd recommend the same thing too, even though I don't have his experience or his knowledge, but you've been doing this and you know, you've been doing this a while and you know your stuff. That's why, probably partially why I haven't seen you in a while because you kind of fixed me up and I'm all set, <laughs> but I, I will be in, I'll tell you when we go. Okay. Um, if I can add one more thing before yes, we yeah, go. Yes, absolutely. I, you know, you, we were talking about my teaching. Uh, I don't know why I didn't uh, say this, but one of the other things I teach is, it's called Cox, oh, excuse me, Cox flexion distraction decompression technique, which is the table we're sitting yes. at. Yes. Right? So that's a technique that uses, it's the original decompression. Really? So decompression has been around for, for a long yeah. time, but now they come up with all this fancy equipment for yeah. you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. But the, the, this, the, this is the technique that I, I use a lot with patients who have yeah. uh, had surgeries that have not worked, oh, that okay. have disc herniations and protrusions and radiculopathy. Yeah. And stenosis is rampant. Yeah, it it's is. Rampant. It? Yes. Uh, it's one of those things that happens as we get older. So yeah, I teach I teach this technique too, and it's a oh. major. It, it, aside from the all approaches we've talked about today, it's a, it's it's a. Well, I another, like this another table. major approach that I use. I've been on well. this table. And it's it's a good one. <laughs> and with that, just just what a couple minutes of that or something. It's yeah. Not usually a long time, but man. I, no. I think I gain a little height every yeah, time I leave it, here. it nourishes your discs. It yeah. uh, helps to flush out inflammation that's local. Yeah, that's I mean, nice. The more we understand about pain, the more we relate it to the inflammatory process. So when you have pain in a specific area, see, inflammation uh, hurts. <laughs> so it's like if, if, you, if your nerves... You have certain types of uh, nerves that transmit uh, damage signals. They're called nociceptors. Right. So, for example, if, you're, if your skin here on your shoulder, let's say, was sunburned, right, mm -hmm. uh, and I touched you lightly, it probably hurt. Mm -hmm. Right now, it doesn't hurt because it's not sunburned. Right. It's because it's sensitized, right? Mm -hmm. It's damaged. So when tissues break down, they start to become damaged. The threshold for that area to generate these these damage signals that go up to the brain and tell you there's something wrong and, and that you interpret as pain, it doesn't take as much. Yeah. Right? Right. And now if you add systemic inflammation to that, now you're really primed to be hurting all the time. Oh, and anywhere double for, whammy going and on anywhere there. for that matter. Yeah. So yeah, I sure. see my job as kind of a 
to try and control that process as best as possible. The other thing that compounds it is lack of movement. Oh, right? Absolutely. Lack of movement. Yes. So healthy, a healthy joint is one that can move in all the directions it's supposed to move in. Uh -huh. And we always try and explore those, those, those ranges and, and try to improve them. And it's important for you, for us, to move, right? Uh, and that's part of that whole Western lifestyle. Sure, yeah. it's like you know we we don't we don't move enough. Well, just in case uh, anyone's interested, so when you're doing a range of motion assessment, are you doing any like goniometry, or are you going uh, more with a visual? You, you know, back in the corner of the room, I do have goniometry, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, it, it's valuable, especially as a uh, as an outcome measure. Mm -hmm. So sure. so you can measure uh, range of hip flexion or range yeah. of cervical you know flexion extension rotation and yeah. so on. Uh, but when you look at global motion, it doesn't tell you the whole story. Yeah, because because you can have one area that's contributing more than it should, another area that's contributing less than it should. It'll look right. good, but it's not. Right. So it it, it has its it has its limitations. Uh, yeah, that's good to know too. I kind of knew that, but the way you just said it kind of tied some things in together for me. I mean, the the uh, insurance industry likes it a lot. It's it's an outcome. They use it as they an outcome measure. measure. Yeah. So we we do it pretty routinely. They they want to see progress. Exactly. You know, and that's one of the ways. That's one of the uh, parameters they use for that. Well, great. Um, before we go, just for the trainers out there, in especially in the North America and maybe other places too. Um, I always have to say this because if I don't, it would be remiss. So just remember that uh, your scope of practice comes into play here. Um, and I, I'm just a trainer, you know, I mean, I'm a master trainer, but whatever, I'm a trainer. Treating pain, that's not in my scope. Although I might be able to have a few tricks up my sleeve to help people, but I'm not treating the pain directly. Um, that's, that's your scope. So make sure when you're out there and you're dealing with your people and you're trying to help them, because they all, we're in this because we want to help people feel better, move better, and quality of life improves, hopefully, as well. Is uh, do what you can, not what you can't, and then send, send people to people like Dr. Mullen um, because together we can work as a team and help people. So I really enjoyed this, man. This was great. It, 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 it's it, been a while we've been nice. going to do this, and it now nice. uh, we get the time, and I guess the COVID situation does have its upside the virus is bad but we're slowing down a little i'm getting a lot done i'm learning a lot eating better and i'm not you know not eating out yep me too taking, taking the time <laughs> yeah. to really kind of make some nutritious yeah. uh, home meals it's great been cooking a lot yeah thank you dr Mo. oh my pleasure all right my friend and um thank you yeah thanks thank a you lot. for this opportunity Oh, my pleasure. Any website you want to mention? Do you have a site? Uh, if you would just Google my name, uh, uh, my website is centralnewyorkchiropractor.com, spelled out. I'll, I'll put that up, uh, a link on there. Thank you again. Thanks for watching, everybody, and have a great day.